Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, make us have perpetual love and reverence for your holy name, for you never fail to help and govern those whom you have set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Isaiah. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually sacrificing in gardens and offering incense on bricks, who sit inside tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh with broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. See, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their laps their iniquities and their ancestors' iniquities together, says the Lord, because they offered incense on the mountains and reviled me on the hills. I will measure into their laps full payment for their actions. Thus says the Lord, as the wine is found in the cluster and they say, do not destroy it for there is a blessing in it, so I will do for my servant's sake and not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it, and my servants shall settle there. The word of the Lord. Please remain seated and read responsively by half verse from Psalm 22. Be not far away, O Lord. Save me from the sword. Save me from the lion's mouth. I will declare your name to my brethren. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand 
for he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither does he hide his face from them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. For kingship belongs to the Lord. A reading from the epistle to the Galatians. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As Jesus stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him, 
He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with them, But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. What is in a name? Identity, first and foremost, in our lives. There are some names that convey virtues. If you think about Abraham Lincoln, you might think about the virtue of honesty. We may recall he was known as Honest Abe. Other names might convey bravery and strength. Richard I of England, for instance, he was also known as Richard the Lionheart. Other folks, not so lucky. Case in point, Ethelred II, he was another king of England. Unfortunately for him, he suffered a series of unfortunate setbacks during his reign. Therefore, he is known in the chronicles of history as Ethelred the Unready. Perhaps it's why it's kind of common, you might see a Richard these days, but you don't, you don't run into too many people named Ethelred, um, not in my experience anyway. Uh, I suppose people want to be, you know, uh, named after somebody a bit more brave and less, uh, you know, prepared. So, uh, but what about our patron, St. Matthew, a tax collector? He wasn't the most popular when it came to his standing in the community. He was actually seen as someone who betrayed his people by collaborating with the Roman occupiers a challenging namesake for us, to say the least. But Jesus called Matthew, and Matthew answered the call to follow, and thus started a new life, opening up to a new identity. But the old identity followed him, and when he was seen eating with Jesus, the people chastised Jesus for eating with sinners and tax collectors. Jesus' response, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So the name Matthew for us perhaps reflects our realizing the need for repentance from worldly ways and turning to God in our lives as a mark of our discipleship. It's also interesting to look at what a name means. As an example, we can turn back to Mr. Lincoln, Abraham. It means father of many. That is a good biblical name. Staying biblical, Abraham's wife, Sarah. That name means princess. 
better than the meaning of her first first name of Sarai. That one, according to some Hebrew researchers, means quarrelsome or argumentative. So I think a bit of uh, an improvement on that. Sarah, princess. And we can't leave out Jesus if we're talking names in the Bible. His name, meaning God saves, or God is salvation. And then we have Luke's gospel this morning, and it mentions a name also. A man identifies himself as legion, meaning we are many. And we'll come back to this man in a minute, but it's fitting then uh, to mention that this, you know, as we move into Luke's gospel this Sunday, you know, it's a gospel in which the writer offers a perspective of Jesus as the Savior for all people. All people. In other words, a universal gospel written for a Gentile audience. A Gentile meaning someone not Jewish, an outsider. Again, that is why Luke's gospel, one of the primary reasons for the existence of Luke's gospel, to present Jesus as the Savior for all people. The gospel writer paints a universal perspective of Jesus by focusing on his ministering to and interactions with outsiders and people on the margins of society. Emphasis is on compassion to those on the periphery who are looked down upon by the establishment. And that's where we begin this morning with our appointed gospel reading. First, we have the location. The writer calls it the country of the Gerasenes, which was a region made up largely of non-Jewish folk. And then there's Jesus jumping off the boat in this garrison city. And who does Jesus meet right out of this boat? A possessed man. One author paints a picture of this man writing, for years he haunted the tombs, the living dwelling in the places of the dead. And he might as well have been dead. No one remembers his given name. They can barely register that he is a human being. Crazy, they call him, reduced to an ailment and haunted by demons. So he wanders the tombs, naked, alone, neglected, ashamed, forgotten, afraid, never knowing peace, never knowing human decency, never knowing love, miserable. He is entombed and tied down by his mental illness, by societal neglect, indifference, dead, to any sense of real living. No one remembers his name. All he can give as some semblance of a name comes from a place of suffering and torment from a multitude of demons. My name is Legion, for we are many. He has ceased being himself, an individual or a person because of all these voices haunting him and possessing him. And then here comes Jesus, and he heals him, a Gentile, an outsider, but a sick, suffering, afflicted man. And he has mercy on him. Again, he heals him. He saves him, because that's what Jesus is. That is Jesus. The Lord saves. That's what he does. And he does so by reaching out, and he reaches out to everyone. Now, we never find out what the real name was of the man that Jesus healed. Even after he's made well, he's only referenced as the man who was possessed. But everyone knows he's been healed. They find him at Jesus' feet, clothed and made well. But again, no name given forgotten if ever known in the community. But to a compassionate God, a specific name like that, it might not matter. Because behind every name, whether they be known or unknown to us, is a person loved by God. Every name can then be understood to mean beloved by God. And that is who we are and what we are. 
But that's also what the demon-possessed man was. God loved him. God saved him. What of demons today? Where do we find them? And who might suffer from them? I believe it's in the addict. I believe it's in the veteran suffering from PTSD. I believe it's the person living on the street or in a shelter or in their car or in a friend's living room. They all have a name. Now, this past week, I had a conversation with some folks who work with the homeless in Wheeling. And we were talking, you know, the storms we had this, this week, this past week, you know, many of us were impacted, but not so much as the homeless of the city. And in these discussions, you know, we discussed the stigma that surrounds this population. Their plight becomes their identity. And when we have already believe, when we already believe that we know someone, it can be quite difficult to make room for a new identity. Look back to Matthew, who I mentioned earlier. Isn't this Matthew a tax collector? We, however, are called to see beyond these basic identities. Will we see Christ in all persons, as our baptismal promises state? Will we see beyond the identity society has prescribed upon others and see them as their foundational being, as beloved by God. For us, this is the power of Luke's gospel. That understanding is what ought to guide us over these next few weeks and months as we'll be working with Luke, because we will be here in this gospel for a while. I think the greatest gift we have is God-given identity. And from that gift for us here today, an understanding and in willingness to act on our responsibility as God's children in this world, we who bear God's image. Jesus embodies God's compassion and encourages his followers to embody that same compassion, thinking grander in terms of the wideness of God's love. On several occasions when questioned about what someone ought to do, Jesus presented two ways. One way would show the doer as merciful or compassionate, and the other way, well, not, not any of those things. But it's always the merciful and the compassionate response and the tangible actions to lift someone up that earns the commission to go and do likewise. I pray that we are always ready and willing to stand up whenever and wherever we see someone attempt to deny one's dignity or invalidate another's identity as someone loved by God by casting them off as unworthy or second class or undesirable, broken beyond fixing. To engage in word and deed, to work together to right the wrongs in a broken world in need of the redeeming power of God's love. Such work is necessary as we build up each other I believe we, in turn, create an environment conducive to the building up of God's kingdom. It is work that seeks to identify those who, in our time, are or have been oppressed, burdened, worn, and weary with the purpose to restore to the one true identity as one known and loved by God. Because that is all we are at the end of the day just like the demon-possessed man restored to his own self. We have all been touched by God's love. And since God loved us so much, we also ought to love and lift up one another. That is biblical. You are loved. We are loved. All are loved. That identity calls us into relationship with each other and with God. May we embrace this identity. Amen.
Please stand. And let us affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed as found on page 5 of your bulletins. We believe in one God. of the people were found in the service leaflet. Let us pray. Let us come before the triune God in prayer, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wholeness, we pray for believers all over the globe, remembering the Anglican Communion, the Episcopal Church and its leaders, especially Michael, our presiding bishop, Mike, our bishop, Matthew, our bishop coadjutor, and Josh and Richard, our priests. Unify us in service of the gospel that we may work together as beloved siblings to share your love with all. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. God of the cosmos, we pray for creation, the gardens, waterways, and creatures near to us and diverse forms of life that remain unseen. Teach us to treat the natural world with reverence, seeking restoration when human divisions have caused harm to your beloved creation. Lord, in your mercy. God of all people, we pray for harmony among the nations and for our leaders, especially Joseph, our president, and Jim, our governor. Cast out from us unclean spirits of greed and fear, that we may work in solidarity with one another for the common good. Lord, in your mercy. God of abundance, we pray for those who are oppressed or in any need. We pray for all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, remembering especially Kate Crosby, Louise Paree, Beth McCleary, Barbara Estep, Sonia Dennis, and Jess B. Gandy. Encourage those who have begun to lose heart. Strengthen and renew us with your spirit. Lord, in your mercy. God of righteousness, we pray for this holy house of worship. Let our gaze upon things eternal, that in thanksgiving for your mercy, we may extend grace to more and more people. Remember for good those among us celebrating a birthday or anniversary, especially Laura Carter, Aaron Rothenbuehler, Joe and Pam Hartman, and John and Dr. Jill Bradshaw. Lord, in your mercy. God of the ages, in your goodness you have sent us faithful witnesses for every time and place. We give you thanks for those saints who now rest in your eternal mercy, especially Richard Mayhurt, in whose memory the altar flowers are given today. Lord, in your mercy.
O God, our Father, give us grace to entrust your beloved children who have died at the hands of violence to your everlasting care and love, and bring them fully into your heavenly kingdom. Pour out your grace and loving kindness on all who grieve. Surround them with your love and restore their trust in your goodness. We lift up to you our weary, wounded souls and ask you to send your Holy Spirit to take away the anger and violence that infects hearts and minds and make us instruments of your peace and children of the light. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And we lift up our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful God, Almighty God, have mercy on you. We give you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning. Your, your, this piece and saying hello can continue downstairs. We have a reception following this service, so uh, stairwell or uh, the um, elevator if you need it. Vacation Bible School is coming up, and so uh, we've had a number of other registrations come this way, but there's still plenty of room. And so if you know a neighbor or grandchildren or friends that have uh, kids aged 4 through 12, uh, grab a registration form and get it to them. Uh, we are still collecting them. Uh, we are still doing a collection for the pull-ups uh, for our food pantry, so please keep that in mind. Uh, ladies Night is coming up on June 28th uh, as well, and there's an announcement about that. And you can speak to Carol, um, Carol Bissett if you'd like to attend. Uh, a big uh, uh, event coming up, uh, obviously, uh, with our 4th of July celebrations coming. Uh, we do have a music concert here on July 4th at 11 a.m. Uh, looking forward to that. But we've also been invited to the picnic uh, at Lawrence Field Parish on July 3rd uh, to uh, you know, hang out with our, our friends from Lawrence Field, but also have a good view of the fireworks um, from Ogilvy later that evening uh, without uh, having to contend with the traffic, I hear, um, around the park. So uh, Lawrencefield Parish, July 3rd, and then uh, July 4th concert here at St. Matthew's. Our next holy hike is also on the schedule, July 16th. Uh, mark that. Uh, the location has uh, not been determined yet, but I assure you I'll be getting out into the woods to go looking for the next great hike. Uh, for this group, so please uh, stay tuned for that location. And then the next uh, summer family night, unfortunately because of the storms this week, we did cancel it uh, this past week, but uh, July 21st and August 18th are still on our calendar, so please mark those for uh, attending if uh, you're able. And then the last announcement that I will make, uh, there is a collaborative effort uh, with uh, Sandscrest and uh, Nancy Woodworth Hill of Lawrenceville Parish uh, for programming called Soul Feast. And there's an announcement about that at the bottom of your bulletin, so please take a look at that. Uh, it looks like it'll be a wonderful um, offering, so I uh, commend that to you. Are there any other announcements for the good of the mission or ministry of the church? Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name, bring offerings and come into his courts.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels of all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he is handed over suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption of Father in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and that the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask for your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, and the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father,
the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and amen with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.